to take part in this conference. In particular, it is, as I see it, as a sort of continuation of the conference in 2014, uh, already organized by Jana and Michal, and I would like to thank both, again, also other people who helped them to organize this conference for inviting me. My team is <coughs> towards a materialism of the real, Badiou and Lacan, and uh, unintentionally, it is a kind of a dialogue that I engage uh, with uh, the paper presented this morning by Jana. Uh, so uh, I'll also try to clarify the status of the one, both in uh, Badiou and Lacan, but from a somewhat different perspective. So before I begin, I would like to say something about the perspective from which I propose to tackle the question that has brought us today together. What does the word materialism mean today? Briefly put, <clears throat> contemporary materialism can be characterized as a position that satisfies two fundamental requirements. First, to think means to think from a position of immanence, and second, to think means to take as its compass those instances of dysfunction which have a power of interruption, differentiation, and multiplication. Far from being an exception to the rule, this position is rather a mainstream in contemporary thought. Indeed, the primacy of the multiple over the one and the primacy of the other over the same this being two crucial consequences of immanentism and the orientation to the real has characterized much of 20th century thought. In fact, it can be considered as a fundamental axiom of contemporary materialism, a distinctive sign of its originality and subversiveness. Today, however, something has radically changed insofar as contemporary materialism seems to be oddly incapable of effecting a cut in the dominant ideological discourse to fracture this ideological discourse. In the present conjecture, dominated by what Badiou calls democratic materialism, which is a true ideology of Batu, not all, since it affirms that there are only bodies and languages, and considers as a result contemporary social space as a space of endless proliferation of identities, we have been witness to a disturbing inversion, the primacy of the multiple and of the other, which has been a mark of an unsettling novelty, a rupturing with the dominant ideology of times, appears today to be absorbed into the dominant discourse, worse, a prolongation of this discourse. Here, Lacan and Badiou will be our guides but you in particular, since for him, only what he calls materialist dialectic is capable of countering democratic materialism. The two of democratic materialism, since according to this position, all there is are bodies and languages. This two of democratic materialism is supplemented, according to Badiou, by the tree of materialistic dialectic. Truth, sorry. I have missed the page. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, truth as exception to what there is. Hence, the fundamental axiom of materialistic dialectic there are only bodies and languages, except there are truths. Yet, truth, this impossible real exception to bodies and languages, must, if we are to maintain a material, materialist, which is to say an immanentist position, manifest themselves as a new body which doesn't mean that uh, this body is natural, far from, far from it. Put differently, materialist conception requires that the appearing of the body of truth depends, like anything else, on the regime of identities and differences organized by the structuring law of a given situation, or to use reduced terminology in logique de monde, the transcendental laws of appearing. In this regard, it could be said that what democratic materialis materialism excludes from the outset is the possibility of other bodily presence or incorporation in a given world, 
incorporation made possible precisely through the emergence of the impossible real. The gap that separates democratic materialism and materialistic dialectic is precisely, I quote from logics, uh, logic also of words, the gap between the multiple body of the human animal and its subjective incorporation, end of quote. I will argue that if the body is the material support, the place in the world of becoming truth, only so far as it incorporates to itself and thus in the world for which it is a body, the trace of the disruptive real or the event to use Badiou's own term, the subversive gesture today from the perspective of materialist dialectic consists precisely in recovering the cutting edge a divisive power of the one and the same, and that precisely in a universe in which the one and the same appear to have no place. Of particular interest in the context of the current rehabilitation of the one and the same is the attempt to radically theorize these two discredited concepts from a perspective of the structurally untotalizable, inconsistent, multiple developed by Badiou, who is considered to be one of the most rigorous theorists of the multiple without one. So let me start by laying out Badiou's claim for the ontological priority of the multiple over the one. The major claim made by Badiou is, as is well known, and it was already developed um, by Jana this morning, that the one is not. Uh, and the consequence, or rather, that uh, if there is one, the one is the fictive, the fictive being of the one is at best an after effect of the operation of counting. While the key point of reference remains the primacy of the multiple over the one, in his more recent work, Badiou sets out to grasp the one not as an effect of the operation the count as one, but as a product of a generic truth procedure and that precisely in a domain in which one would least expect it, namely in politics, which is, by definition, the realm of the multiple. We can find an understanding of the specifically political consequences of this re-elaboration of the one in Badiou's discussion of the notion of equality. The privilege of equality is sketched out by its contrast with liberty and fraternity. Unlike those two terms nowadays contaminated respectively by neoliberalism or commun communitarianism, only the concept of equality provides, according to Badiou, sufficient force of rupture due precisely, in the words of Badiou, to its abstraction. It is only by being subtracted from all communal predicates as well as from the juridical statuses and hence, as an emptiness of the same, to use Badiou's own expression, that equality is immediately prescri prescriptive. Equality generates equality, as it were. My claim is that equality, to the extent that it produces always the same effect in a given situation, is an instance of the real in politics, to be understood in Lacan's sense of the real. Now, how are we to understand this realism of the same, which breaks both with the imaginary similarity and the symbolic nomination? Obviously, not just any form of collective is compatible with the authority of the same, to borrow Badiou's term. Actually, the only collective that is compatible with the same is one in which no singularity is placed as an exception in which its singularity is the same as any other. Only such a collective is compatible with the real sameness. This equality without identity or predicate, the sameness of pure singularities, is what Badiou terms, as we know, communism of singularities. In this regard, communism of singularities is strictly speaking not a name of any community, it would be more appropriate perhaps to say that it is an impossible name or a name of that which in politics cannot be named, communist, a community. Communism is therefore a generic name for the very genericity in politics. Or to quote Badiou, communism is a generic name for the impossible. 
Yet it is in Badiou's close reading of Saint Paul that one can see a new status of the one re-elaborated. Crucial for Badiou is a paradoxical feature of the eventual one. For the eventual one is by definition divisive, one that divides into two, a self-referential division, that is, since it necessarily involves a decision as to the actual taking place of the event and the consequences that such a ratification of its taking place impose on the inhabitants of that situation, that is, their commitment as subjects. It is a divisive one, yet it is precisely through its capacity to divide that it generates a for all, the universal. It is because the taking place of an event is from the start point, standpoint of the law of the situation undecidable that an event can summon no one in particular, or to quote Badiou, the eventual one is that which inscribes no difference in the subject to which it addresses itself. End of quote. This means that it summons anybody, or one could say everybody, in the words of Badiou, unless addressed to all, the one crumbles and disappears. For Badiou, and this is my claim, the question of universality is ultimately the question of the one of the same. The maxim of universality that is rooted in an event is that the sign of the one is the for all, or without exception. Put simply, the one is one only if it is for all. The universal, according to Badiou, is based on the capacity of the one not to totalize, to unite, but rather to divide. It is the power of division of the eventual one which creates universality. But in what sense does the eventual one create the for all? It is not addressed to some pre-given particular multiplicity, but rather to a paradoxical multiplicity, which is in a situation as such still indiscernible. It is not difficult to recognize in this indiscernible multiplicity, but use peculiar form formulation of the not all, with one essential specification, namely the not all is not discovered, it is produced. It is a multiplicity which never ceases to generate an elusive, insituable excess. The Badusian not all is characterized as, I use his uh, formulation, a multiplicity in excess of itself. For the eventual one to be truly universal, the for all at which it is addressed, the for all it summons needs first to be produced because the instance of the address does not exist as yet, or more precisely, it only exists as caught up in the existing communal particularities or partitions. In other words, it is not enough to proclaim that the truth is for all, since this for all must manifest itself bodily. That is to say, it has to be materialized, incorporated into a body, what but you will let later uh, called the transhuman body of a truth. The radical novelty of Badiou's account of the Pauline universalism can then be seen precisely in his insistence that the for all is articulated to the not all. Indeed, if the for all and the not all are not incompatible, if the for all itself requires the not all as its presupposition, this is because the same operation that makes the detotalization possible, that is to say, that makes it possible for a multiplicity to exceed its own limits, constitutes also the verification of the universal. The eventual one, insofar as it is for all, necessarily involves an endless production of an insituable excess, a process of ceaseless exceeding surpassing itself of a generic multiplicity. But to the extent that it necessarily implies the not all, the one which is for all must be situated from the perspective of the infinite. The one that is articulated with the for all is the one in the infinite. What then is produced through 
Poland's gesture of the division of division that is precisely the division which puts invalidates the existing fundamental uh, the divisions of uh, his world, namely the distinction between Jews and not Jews on the one hand and distinction between free men and slaves. So this division of division, uh, according to Badiou, is a universal formula for the division of the subject, a formula which produces a sameness and an equality. This can only be achieved if some inhabitants of a given situation, as a result of the eventual rupture, commit themselves to quote Badiou, to the faithful construction of an infinite generic multiple. It is precisely in this context that the axiomatization of equality takes on its full value. What specifies politics as a truth procedure is its capacity to convoke this infinity of the situation as subjective universality. What distinguishes an emancipatory politics is precisely its ability, I quote, to treat the infinite as such according to the principle of the same, the egalitarian principle, end of quote. In other words, by assigning to the egalitarian prescription the function of the counting as one each and every singularity that composes the existing situation, but you seek to show that just, in just as in mathematics, in politics too, the operation of transfinitization can be set in motion. At this point, we encounter an unexpected twist. Indeed, I quote, what singularizes the political procedure is the fact that it proceeds from the infinite to the one, end of quote. Every emancipatory politics proceeds from the infinite of a given situation, but its aim is to produce the same, or to use Badiou's expression, to produce the one, that is, the real in accordance with an egalitarian maxim. This really, in accordance with an egalitarian maxim, is precisely what I have termed the one of the same. One of the paradoxes of politics as a generic procedure, which has to do with the infinite at all levels, situation, the state of situation, post-eventual change in a given situation, is certainly the paradox of the Aleph of emancipation, that is, the number which is capable of counting the infinity of generic singularities, this Aleph of emancipation is the one. The one, then, is the paradoxical transfinite number of politics. However, the status of that, what I have termed Aleph of emancipation, is far from being univocal. This elab uh, elaboration of the one in the not all universe enables us to account for the stakes of an ongoing theoretical political quarrel about the status of the name in the field of politics. Indeed, today, contemporary left-wing thought is hopelessly divided by the question of how to conceive of that one of the same. Lacan's elaboration of the status of the one of the same can help us clarify the crucial stake in this quarrel. Lacan raised the thorny question of the one of the same in his elaboration of the repetition of jouissance, since for him, repetition always aims at jouissance. Jouissance can only be attained through the repetition of a marking that the first emergence of jouissance has left on the body. However, the mere fact of repet repetition produces a loss, I quote from his seminar 17. It is in the place of this loss introduced by repetition that we see the function of the lost object emerge of what I am calling the petit a. End of quote. Crucial here is that this object, the object A, or surplus enjoyment, is a retroactive effect of repetition itself. Although it is not part of the chain of signifiers that repeat themselves, it attains a special place that Lacan termed the place of sameness. It is precisely at this level that Lacan articulates the same with the one. There are namely two figures of the one. Indeed, according to Lacan, the one of the same is not to be confused with the one which repeats itself. This is the one which is the effect of counting as one. The one that repeats itself is the one of the unary trait, in short, the one of identification, which makes it possible for the subject to be counted. 
The difference between those, these two ones can therefore be explained as follows. The identification with the unary trait reduces the difference to a trait which allows for the subject to be classified, to receive its place in the symbolic order. The one of the same, by contrast, stands for a pure difference as such, or in Lacan's words, it stands for the sameness of difference. What is new in Lacan's conception of the same is that it is separated from the subject of the signifier and refers primarily to the body. I quote, the difference between the same and the other is based on the fact that the same must be materially the same. The notion of the matter grounds the same, end of quote. In a sense, the one and of the same is just like a trace. It is memorial, ultimately a letter that marks a contingent encounter between the body and the signifier. The same of the difference is for that reason the one beyond all differences, beyond all particularities. With the respect of the one of the unary trait, the one of the same is in a radical sense the other. The one of the same is that which is the most proper to me, the point of my singularity, and at the same time that which signals the presence of the other as such, the presence of the inhuman in me. What consequences can be drawn from Lacan's conception of the one of the same for contemporary theorizing of, politi of politics? Psychoanalysis and politics of emancipation share the assumption of the one of the same as constitutive for the becoming of a subject. And they both proceed to its production, or more precisely, its extraction, by means of a reconstruction, reconstruction of the trace, of the marking left by some traumatic event, traumatic in the sense that by remaining an in assimilable surplus in a given situation, it disrupts the existing order, thereby drawing a line of demarcation between before and after. If psychoanalysis and politics, emancipatory politics that is, share the one and the same as a common point of departure, they diver diverge as to their respective goals and the ways in which they treat this one uh, and the same. Indeed, Nothing appears to be more foreign to psychoanalysis than a transformative emancipatory politics. Psychoanalysis seeks, seeks to circumscribe this one of the same in order to neutralize it. Its goal is to make it possible for the subject to separate himself from this one and thus to prevent its repetition. In contrast to this procedure, emancipatory politics, by setting in motion in motion an endless verification of the egalitarian prescription seeks on the contrary to prevent that the one of the same doesn't stop writing itself, doesn't stop being written. For emancipatory politics, there is the universal, the for all, for all only to the extent that the one of the same doesn't stop writing itself. While both emancipatory politics and psychoanalysis take what could be termed the real of the same as their compass, psychoanalysis seeks to separate out the one of the same, an operation that proceeds one by one, as there is no such a thing for psychoanalysis as a generalized one of the same, a one of the same that would be for all. To repeat once more, for psychoanalysis, the one of the same is a singularized same, the one of the same that supports the singularity of a particular subject. This is why the principles that govern this extraction of the same in psychoanalysis cannot provide us with any guidelines as to a possible action at the collective level. But this also means that for psychoanalysis, the always singularized one of the same is what makes the transfinitization in the domain of the collective impossible. This insistence on the unsurpassable horizon of the not all requires that we retrace a, retrace a dividing line between contemporary theorists of the one of the same, partisans of the universal on the one hand, and militants of the exception incarnated in the name of Jew on the other. For these partisans of the exception, 
The one of the same is a name which precludes the for all, a name which cannot be universalized. This is why uh, this uh, position is uh, defended by uh, Lacanian ex-Maoists. So Lacan is crucial reference in, uh, for this position. For contemporary universalists, emancipatory politics, rather than being disarmed when faced with the not all, has found a way of handling structural deadlocks of the not all by means of the axiomatization of equality. Logically situated at the beginning, the one of the same is only constructed by means of a retroactive anticipation that is in the future anterior, at the end of the anticip anticipated completion of the infinite generic procedure. For contemporary theorists of the exception, by contrast, the one of the same, which for them is incarnated in some irreducible particularities, the name due to be precise, entails the exclusion of the for all. Both parties then in, involved in this fratricide war between uh, Jewish and non-Jewish ex-Maoists concede that the st crucial stake today is none other than the articulation of the one of the same with the universal. One of the fundamental lessons of emancipatory politics is that there are names which are divisive and cannot be born otherwise than by being subjectified. For instance, to be communist, worker, immigrant, woman, gay, and so on. Jewish ex-Maoists make at this point an additional yet crucial distinction. Beside these names which can be subjectified or not, for instance, uh, the term worker designates both a social category and a political subject, there is a name exception, a name which cannot not be subjectified, the name Jew. The name Jew is not a name that one could choose or not. Rather, it is a name which, in a sense, one cannot get rid of, even if one wants to. It is already there in the real. The question here is only whether speaking being Jew is willing to affirm it as a subject. This is why the name Jew, which could be presented as an accident, a contingency, is endowed with a particular signification for the speaking being Jew. To become a subject requires that the speaking being Jew turns this accidental trait, this peculiarity which has been assigned to him as his affliction, into a reason and justification for his action that can have consequences that go well beyond his individuality. From this perspective of the real in the name Jew, there are two distinctions that must be made between the name Jew and all the other names. First, a distinction between a subjectifying and predicative use of the name. And second, and more importantly, a line of separation must be drawn within the subjectifying use of the name itself, namely between those names on which one can give up or not, and the one name exception, the name Jew, on which, in some radical sense, one is not allowed to give up. The name Jew can thus be considered as one of the subject's names, but what it makes it incomparable to any other name of the subject, what makes it literally the name which is above every name, results paradoxically, this is according to Regnaud, from the intervention of emancipatory politics, because this politics does not believe in the real of any name, this is Renault's position, precisely because it aims at the universal, at the for all. Put simply, for politics, the price to be paid for the fact that any name can be subjectified, that is, that it can become the name of the political subject, the name for all, an empty name that anyone can say it as I, is to make a sacrifice of one name, the name Jew, the name which incarnates the absolute particularity, that which is by definition non-universalizable, non-universalizable, a name which is by definition not for all. One could then, what one could, could then say that it is the sacrifice of this name which opens up the space for the political subjectivation. 
And this is precisely the reason why the name Jew and politics, not just any politics, but precisely the only politics that counts, at least for Lacanian ex-Maoists, the emancipatory politics are radically incompatible. According to Ragnot, politics is based on the assumption, an illusory assumption in his view, that it is possible to displace, to substitute arbitrarily the names of the subject. Unlike psychoanalysis, which is supposed to defend the real of the name, politics confronts the speaking being Jew with an impossible dilemma, a forced choice between politics, the sole thing that is sacred in their eyes, and the duty to renew the rights of the name passed over in silence, that is, name Jew. For a new a politics that imposes on the subject this choice, either emancipatory politics or saving the name, necessarily discredit itself. And conversely, worthy of being saved is only a politics that enables us, I quote, to hear the name in the name of which we speak or remain silent, end of quote. It is, in, it is my claim that if the question of the name is so acute in politics today, this is because it concerns the status of the one of the same in, in politics. The issue here, of course, is not the question of whether politics allows for some names to be forever, eternal, but rather whether this name forever, this eternal name is a name of some community which already exists in reality or, on the contrary, is a name of the political subject which is still to come. To repeat once more, the question here is about the modality of subjectifying this one that, that returns to the same uh, place. This is why this is a category of the real. Is the one that presents itself to the subject as an indelible givenness or the one which is to be produced, the one in a world which results from practicing an egalitarian prescription in a given situation and which therefore traverses all communal nominations. For Badiou, the subject of a truth always lays claim on such names which are above every name. Or more explicitly, and I quote from his Saint Paul, all true names are above every name. They let themselves be inflected and declared just as mathematical symbolism does in every language, according to every custom and through the traversal of all differences. Every name from which a truth proceeds is a name before the Tower of Babel, but it has to circulate in this tower." End of quote. From such a perspective, the marking of a speaking being by some indelible one, the one of the same, is constitutive of the becoming of a subject only to the extent that it passes what Badiou calls a single limit point, that of the for all. In a word, the true value of the real one resides in its compatibility with universalism. In this respect, and precisely in a Lacanian sense, the name of the subject, the subject's proper name, incomparable to any other name, be it Jew or whatever, instead of being an obstacle to contemporary universalism, represents, in Badiou's words, the only real that can be opposed to the dictatorship of predicates." End of quote. It is through their inherent power of dissolution of any communitarian predicate that real names, the names of the subject, constitute a paving stone for contemporary universalism. This is why Badiou, in his characteristic provocative style, proclaims that the fundamental problems for Jews themselves today is to take up the challenge of creating a new place, indeed of creating a new Jew, a new name Jew which would be destined to all. To maintain that the task today is to create a new Jew is but another way of saying that the name Jew is not a destiny, not even for a speaking being Jew. Paradoxically enough, on this point, emancipatory politics meets psychoanalysis. By insisting on the one of the same of a particular subject results from some contingent yet traumatic encounter with the real, Psychoanalysis does not ratify the theoretical political stance adopted by some uh, Lacanian ex-Maoists, according to which the name Jew prescribes, so to speak, in advance the subjective position of a speaking being Jew. On the contrary, just like 
emancipatory politics based on its fidelity to the event. For psychoanalysis, it is the encounter with the real that presents an opportunity for the subject to confront the choice of the name that was imposed on him, whether due or whatever. So, whether to take a distance vis a vis this, um, this uh, name or adopt it, affirm it as a subject. To situate the name in relation to the real that assigns the subject his condition, this is uh, Lacan's definition, amounts to rendering politics impossible or to make it an exception. The discussion revolving around the name Jew is situated along this edge. Either politics of emancipation is impossible, that is to say that it merely arbitrarily substitu substitutes one name for an another, thereby indicated that names are mere semblance in relation to the real, this is how Lacanian ex-Maoists -Ma see politics, or politics is an exception, which means that to be a political militant is to consent to remain faithful to the name of an event what displaces one particular one of the same and allows for another name, another one of the same, to take its place and become that in the name of which one speaks or keeps silent. What contemporary theorizing of politics has to explore is that the counterpoint point of, um, sorry, counterpart of the primacy of the multiple over the one is balanced by the fact that there is the one in the real. It is this eventual one, the real one, and the defense against this eventual real that, are, that is at stake in politics. Thank you.